When I was a kid, my grandmother thought that I would one day become a meteorologist, TV weather person, because I liked being in front of the camera and I was really into science stuff. And unfortunately, I went off and became a physics educator slash physics education researcher instead. Well, today her dream comes true because I have learned how to import weather data into a Jupyter notebook. And this is now my new favorite physics adjacent hobby is looking at this weather data stuff. Because yes, I, I do like weather stuff. It is interesting. It is real world relevant. And it's kind of fun to try to model. So if you go to the link in the description below, you're going to find a sample uh, Jupyter notebook that's like this, but I've removed a couple of the ID codes because I want you to be able to go and find your own for it. Um, you're going to need two pieces of information. One, you're going to need um, an access code from NOAA, N-O-A-A. -A. Um, it's free. You just have to sign up for one. Uh, I'm not sharing mine or showing it on the screen because I want you to go get your own, that way it'll track your information, etc. It won't get attached to mine. But the other thing you need to find is the station ID of the weather station that you want to pull data from. There's two ways to do this. There's a graphical user interface that works about half the time, at least on my machine. And then there is this text database. Let me actually zoom in on this bit. For example, suppose you're me and you are interested in your local weather in Jacksonville. I'm going to look for the Jacksonville location here. You can even confirm the, uh, I'm guessing that's latitude and longitude there. I don't think we have a negative. Do we have a negative longitude? longitude? I suppose we do. Um, but anyway, you can find your location, the, the, uh, the station that you're interested in. Maybe you're interested in Birmingham, maybe you're interested in Atlanta, Hartsfield International Airport. Uh, I'm interested in Jacksonville, so I'm going to grab this code here. What you do is you grab the station ID, you copy it, you bring it over here, and then you paste it here inside the quotes for station ID. Now there's an extra little bit of code that doesn't appear on that page. You just have to put GHCND colon in front of it. Um, that's just so it could pull that station's information, just whatever reason it doesn't have it listed on the text file uh, in the other tab. Uh, so this is what it looks like for Jacksonville International Airport. Uh, I'm going to be running this activity at a summer camp in South Carolina in a couple weeks, so I put in the Columbia Metropolitan Airport as well, uh, just another example to look at. What you'll do is run that code cell. That's going to save your access ID for NOAA, and it's going to save your weather station ID that you're interested in, and it's going to tell you that you're ready to go. Next, we're going to import the libraries that we need. Uh, this requires a few libraries. Uh, there's requests. This is the library used for getting information from websites, because uh, ultimately this is coming from a web page somewhere, and so you're using requests to get that information. Pandas, I have been learning pandas. Uh, I need to make a series on pandas coming up soon, because this is the default library for data science, large data sets, big data, like they like to say these days. Uh, JSON is going to be useful for accessing a JSON file. And then NumPy we have used plenty uh, on this channel. And then DateTime is just there to convert some DateTime data format into strings and vice versa. So we'll, we've run that. Next, we're going to read in the weather data that we're interested in. The first thing you're going to do is ask for the years that you're interested in, the initial year and the final year. Now, this you may have to play around with because some of these weather databases are a little bit incomplete, uh, particularly if you go to look for precipitation information or, um, or hours of, of cloud cover, percent cloud cover. Those aren't recorded every day or even every year. So if you ever get an error on this, try narrowing the region of the years or try looking up the database on the web page itself. Uh, and you can try to get an idea of where the holes are so you can avoid that. Um, I need to tidy up this notebook. Uh, so that uh, it will just ignore the, the blank days. Um, I think I'll do that before I release kind of a formal tutorial on how to do this. This is really just me playing around with this uh, on the channel to just to geek out over it. Um, and then we're going to create some, some initial lists. So I'm interested 
in the dates that we're recording. That's going to be our, D, our independent variable. Uh, we're going to record temperatures. That's the average, min temperature, max temperature, and precipitation. Uh, and so then we're going to loop over all these years. So we're going to go from year I to year F plus 1 because Python always has to ignore the last item in the range function. Uh, so then we'll convert things into the year here so that we can get uh, our, our, our year information. It's going to tell us what year it's working on. And then we're going to go looking for the information. So if you wanted to grab the information itself, if you wanted to grab the actual uh, uh, database itself, you could go to uh, this URL here. You notice that we're kind of building out the URL based on the information we're interested in. So this is where that station ID comes in because we need to uh, we need to tell it which station we're interested in. We also need to tell it what year we're interested. So we're going to go uh, over the span of that year from January 1st to December 31st. Um, once we've built that URL, we'll use the request.get function to say, I want this URL and I want you to access it using my token. This is that NOAA token that you'll uh, go and get uh, in that first uh, code cell. Uh, we'll do the same thing here. It can only handle so many requests at once. So this is just pulling in additional data. So we have an R for the first request, an R2 for the second request, etc. And then we're going <clears> to <throat> load those responses as JSON files. This is just so that we can work with it a little bit more easily later on. And so here's where we're going to start gathering information. We've got average temperatures, minimum temperatures, maximum temperatures, precipitation, and the dates. Uh, then we'll start putting those values together here. Uh, we do at some point have to do some conversion with this. Okay, that comes later in a second. So let's click run there. Um, depending on how many years you put in, this is going to take a minute. So this is your chance to go for a coffee break or something uh, while you wait for it to finish loading all of those years. And there we go. We're finished. Uh, so then we'll come down here and we're going to create our data frame. So the idea of a data frame it's Python's equivalent of a spreadsheet. Now, there are probably pandas fans watching this video pulling their hair out when I say that, but visually, that's basically what it is. We're working with, with a spreadsheet without having to have all the cells in front of it. So it's just stored in Python the same way you store an array of information. You're storing a, a big labeled array, basically. And so we're going to take all of the stuff that we've got. We're going to take, for example, the date and the average temperature, the min temperature, the maximum temperature, etc. And we're going to add all that stuff to the data frame. We're going to say, OK, put all this stuff into the data frame. You notice we have to do a little bit of conversion because it's stored as Celsius. Uh, usually I'm a stickler for the metric system, but Fahrenheit, maybe it's the fact that we take our temperature, our body temperature in Fahrenheit, and I just have a better sense of what temperature is in Fahrenheit. Uh, but we're going to convert it to temperature there. So we finished running the cell here. I had to make an adjustment to the years because I ended up with an incomplete data set. So we're going to look at 2016 to 2020 instead. But this is what the top of that database looks like. It looks like a spreadsheet, basically. We've got the dates in one column, average temperature, minimum temperature, maximum temperature, precipitation. Um, and now let's, let's take a look at some graphs. What, what does this weather data look like? Let's try getting the maximum temperature versus time and the minimum temperature versus time. Uh, you also notice I'm running this off of the data frame itself, df, df underscore temp. Um, that's because it has some matplotlib functionality built into the pandas library, which is really cool, the fact that you can just plot directly off of the data frame itself. And so here's our maximum temperature. Obviously, it's going to cycle higher, hotter and colder, hotter and colder, uh, just based on the, uh, the time of year here. We're peaking above 100. Uh, we peak above 100 again here in 2019. I think we're going to be getting above 100 this summer again as well. We're also getting some variation in the lows there. Uh, but you can see this nice yearly cycle going from winter to summer. And then we take a look at the min temperatures, and those follow a very similar pattern, though obviously the vertical scale is different. Right? We're going from 30 up to 80 here. Here we're going from... Uh, for just under 50 to just over 100 for the maximum. Makes sense. The minimum has to always be less than the maximum. So let's play around a little bit more with some of those plots. Let's put those two plots, the max and the min, on the same graph. So here you've got your, uh, your maximum and your minimum temperature here. One of the things I notice is that this gap 
is decently consistent, right? So this one, it, it closes up a little bit more, but these gaps, oh, they're pretty good. Like, like this pattern, you're seeing a pretty nice regular pattern. Let's run our next cell to get some more graphs. Uh, here what I did is uh, created a delta temperature list. Uh, so what this has is for each day, it's gonna take the maximum temperature minus the minimum temperature. What was the range of temperatures for that day? And if you plot that, if you plot delta temperature, the range, uh, you get a pretty interesting graph. It looks like at certain parts of the year, there's a much uh, higher uh, variation in the temperature. And in some parts of the year, there's very low variation in the temperature, which is kind of cool. Uh, I suppose I suppose when it marks the year, that's gonna be the January 1st, probably. Uh, no, actually, oh, yeah, yeah, well, yes, yes, because that's the low point here. That's the, that's gonna be January-ish, so that's gonna be January 1st there. So yeah, we're getting a higher variation each January, much less variation in the summer, so that's pretty cool. Um, and then you start to wonder, well, what does, you know, how does that uh, relate to other things, right? How do, how do these things relate to each other? So what I've done in this cell is tried to figure out uh, some correlations between these things. So here, for example, we've got uh, the precipitation versus the average temperature. So there's a distribution here. How much rain are you going to get based on the temperature of the day? Well, you notice there's a whole lot of zeros because there's, believe it or not, in Florida, there are days where it does not rain. Um, but then there, are, as you get a little bit higher in the temperature, right around here, there's this peak of precipitation. So it's kind of interesting. You get a neat little distribution there. Uh, you can do the same thing with the minimum temperature of the day. You can do the same thing with the distribution over the maximum temperature of the day. So a lot more spread out there for the max temperature. That's kind of cool. Uh, this is one of my favorite graphs. This is the precipitation versus the ch change in temperature of the day. So this is that delta temperature we calculated earlier. This one's definitely uh, all over the place. There's a peak here and a peak here, uh, which is kind of interesting. And then it kind of tapers off here. Now, of course, you also have to keep in mind what's going on at the extremes here. You know, there aren't a lot of days where the temperature changes by that much, and so there aren't going to be as many rainy days when it uh, when the temp when the when the temperature varies by that much. So just keep in mind that that we probably need to scale this down to be some kind of intensive property instead. And then this one's kind of cool. This is the change in temperature versus the average temperature. And I really want to believe that there's some kind of correlation here with this cluster here and things getting spread out here. But eh, if you do the math on a on a regression there, it's it's basically no correlation there. So anyway, that's how you can uh, access some weather data in a Jupyter notebook. I think it's kind of a fun activity. I'm going to get uh, deeper into this, more into the analysis later, and probably make an actual formal tutorial on this and on pandas. I'm really enjoying learning pandas. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.